Okay, is it on? Am I working? First thing, I, I want to thank whoever it is that put this first aid kit up here. <laughs> they've seen me turn. They've seen all the scars. And <laughs> Oh, is that another one over there? Yeah. I, I would like you to know that these marks on my head are not from turning. Uh, that, that was caused by the dermatologist, but uh, somebody knows, knows me. Uh, this is Robert Voth. Robert and I turned together in our in my shop, and he has his lathe, and I have mine, and uh, and it's it's really a lot of fun uh, to have somebody in the shop with you, you know, turning, because uh, you know we have a great time, and uh, we both turn turn a lot of the same stuff. And tonight I'm going to try to uh, I'm going to talk about how to take a log and turn it into a bowl. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to know who I'm talking to because there may be people here that know more about this than I do, and I don't want to say anything stupid. Uh, how many people in here have taken a green log and turned it into a bowl? Okay, good. So we have some that haven't. All right. Uh, first thing, green wood that's all we that's all we turn uh, basically we turn we may turn a little bit of dry wood but it's in the process of making a finial or or a christmas ornament or something that we don't want to move but for the most part even things like that that we turn we have we turn it out of wood that we have harvested and turned it down into square blanks and let it dry ourselves but it's still got a lot of moisture in it so Mostly we're working with wood that has a lot of moisture content in it. And one of the keys to turning green wood is knowing what you're turning and knowing a little bit about the properties of wood. And when I first started turning green wood, uh, I really had a lot of trouble with the way the wood would dry and, and where I was taking it out of the log. So uh, I try. I bought a book uh, to try to learn a little bit about trees and how to identify trees, and and a book about turning green wood. And there is a book on the uh, a turning book that's called uh, Turning Green Wood, and it's probably one of the best books uh, that I've ever read uh, about turning green wood. It talks about the properties of the wood, the sales of the wood, and it talks about uh, if you take wood out of, if you have a log and you take a bowl out of the top of the log, it'll tell you which way it's going to change shape. If you take it out of the bottom, it'll tell you which way it's going to change shape. Now you say, well, I didn't know a log had a top and a bottom because they're all round. <laughs> well, they really don't, but what we're talking about is the shape of the rings. You've got rings going this way and you've got rings going this way. And if you take a bowl out of the bottom of the log, then the top of the bowl, the rings are going to go around the bowl this way. And if you take it from the top, they're going to go the other way. But if you take it out of the middle, that's the, the wood that's not going to move very much because those rings are very short on the sides. But those are things that you can learn in, in, in books. Uh, also, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is where do you find wood? Uh, we get our most of our wood from tree trimmers. Uh, I have a real good friend that's a tree trimmer in Gainesville, and he knows the kind of woods that I like. And so when he's cutting something down, if he sees that I like it or I will like it, he calls me. And I hook onto my trailer and I go get it. And I make him a lot of wood stuff in return, uh, but uh, he supplies me with all the wood that I want. Uh, cities cut down trees occasionally, uh, or uh, utility companies, etc., and they're always glad for us guys to come along and haul them off for them because then they don't have to. Uh, construction uh, contractors sometimes have to cut trees down. So if you're driving by a construction site and they've cut down a tree, uh, stop and, and ask them if you can have some of it. Uh, I recently got a bunch of pecan off of a contractor that was uh, redoing a drainage ditch through Gainesville and he cut down some really nice pecan trees 
And I went and talked to him, and he said, just have at it. So I went and cut up, we cut up a lot of logs out of that and made some nice bowls out of those trees. Uh, friends with land. Uh, I have several friends with land with a lot of trees, and uh, they let me cut all the wood off of them that I want to. Uh, storm damage, of course, uh, uh, in Gainesville, and I don't know what they do here, but in Gainesville, when, when we do have a storm, and, and it's not just necessarily a storm, uh, they have a collection point uh, there in Gainesville, and I take all of my brush and scrap down there and put it there. But every time I go down there, there's a huge pile of trees that have been cut up, and I always look. And sometimes I go away with two or three logs uh, that I haul back home from that, uh, from that collection site. Because all they're going to do is grind them up in the mulch, and they don't care if you haul them out. So uh, Denton is probably... Yeah, yeah. He and I went down there one day and dumped the load, and we came back home with, with three logs, and they were, I mean, they were the biggest logs. I've still got one of them. We've still got one of those big old logs that we haven't used. But uh, that's a good place to find free wood also. Uh, we find that the best wood uh, for making bowls are, uh, are, is walnut, pecan works real good, uh, Bradford pear, mesquite, bodark, uh, elm, box elder, sycamore, hickory, crab apple, uh, apricot, peach, plum. Uh, your fruit woods are all real pretty woods uh, the only problem with fruit woods, if you're going to deal with fruit woods, you need to deal with them very quickly uh, because fruit woods have a tendency not to, to want to stay in one piece very long. They want to crack and split wide open. And so if you're going to turn a, a, take a piece of fruit wood, you need to take it to your shop, cut it into a bowl blank, turn it, rough it down, put it in the alcohol or however how you're going to dry it, and... Uh, and get it dried as quickly as you can to keep it from cracking, otherwise you'll lose it. Uh, I've lost some really nice apricot by letting it sit on the shelf too long. Now, as I go along, if you have a question, you just stop me and ask, okay? Uh, first thing, uh, identifying trees, and, it, and it's sometimes difficult to, to, if somebody calls you and says, says, hey, I've got a, a tree out here that I think you'd like. Uh, you, you need to know what that tree is. And, and there are several books. I have this one that I use. You can identify trees in the summertime by the leaves. You can identify them by bark. Uh, you can identify them by whatever fruit they might produce. Uh, this is another book that I use to identify trees. Uh, I get it wrong every now and then. Pardon? Which one? This one? Yeah. Okay. This one I bought at a half price bookstore. It's probably one of the best ones I've ever had on identifying trees. Uh, we I got a call from a guy that uh, one day, the, uh, a friend of mine, and he said, I've got two walnut trees on my place that I'm going to have to take down. And he said, and I thought you might want them. Well, somebody calls me about walnut tree, man. We're, we're in the truck headed that way. And uh, I went out and looked at them, and when I looked at them, I, I, I looked for nuts on the ground. And, and I found some, but I was really wasn't real sure that, that they were walnut trees. I kind of thought they were hickory trees. But I had seen, generally a walnut tree, the, the main trunk of it does not get very tall before it branches out. And these trees were pretty tall, and, but they weren't so tall that they couldn't have been a walnut. So I called up my tree trimmer guy and I said, I need you to, one of them was real close to a power line, so I didn't want to lay it down. So I called him and I said, would you come lay these trees down for me? So we went out there and he said, I told him they were, I thought they were walnuts. Well, he he cut the first one down and he kind of looked at me funny and he said I don't think you got a walnut here I think it's a hickory and they were both hickory trees so I misidentified them and 
we didn't get a bowl out of it. <laughs> they, the trees were already too far gone, but the guy got two trees cut down by me. And that'll, that's what will happen to you. Uh, we have cut down some trees that, uh, you know, we really didn't have any use for because we misidentified them. But it's very easy to misidentify a hickory and a walnut, but if I'd have just used my instincts and said, nah, it can't be a, a walnut because it's too tall. And it was, and, and that's what they were. So learn to identify trees. Uh, when you're out cutting, if, you, if you're gonna cut a log to make a bowl out of, uh, and I'm not gonna talk too much about size because you can cut as big a log as you wanna cut to make as big a bowl as you wanna make, but when you're cutting the length of the bowl, of the, of the log, cut it about four inches, uh, four to six inches longer than the diameter of the log itself. So uh, if you're looking at a, a, a log that's uh, 12, 14 inches in diameter, then cut the length of your log uh, four to six inches longer than that. The reason for that is that log is gonna check on you on the ends. So when you, even if you seal it up, you're still gonna get some checking and if you don't process it right away, meaning cut it into a bowl blank and then seal it up, you're going to get a lot of checking. So that gives you enough room to saw that checking off when you get ready to process the into a, uh, into a bowl blank. Now, shape. Round, of course, is the best shape for bowls, in my opinion, because the bowl is going to be round. If you're going to do uh, natural edge bowls, then I like a, a lot of contour to the outside of the bowl for a natural edge bowl. Now what I've drawn up here is a, a log. And that represents the pith of the log. Now, how many of you have ever seen a, a log or a tree where all of the logs had the pith directly in the middle of the log, but very few, very few. And the, the reason that that pith is not in the middle of that, that log, it may start out there when that tree is a sapling, but nature moves that pith to one side or the other. When the wind blows and it pushes on that tree in this direction, then the tree is gonna grow more on this side than it does on this side. So the pith is gonna go to that side. Now this is an example of a pretty good extreme. You see where the pith is on that? Now this, I'm surmising that this tree was bending kinda like that. Because you can see the pith is way over here on that side. So if you were gonna make a bowl out of that particular log right there, you, you're gonna have to cut through that pith at some point. So you either get one nice bowl out of one side of it, or you get a bowl out of it like that, which would be a deep bowl. And that's the first thing I do when I put the, the log on my, my uh, sewing block, is I try to determine where I can get the two best shaped bowls out of this log. So if I had this log, I would take a ruler and I would put it through the pith and I would see that I've got one fairly shallow bowl here and one pretty deep bowl over here. So I would keep rotating until I found a direction which would be right there. And I've got two fairly equal size bowls. So I would mark my log. Now this, what I'm telling you to, is the way I do it. It's not necessarily, there are other ways, but this is the way I do it. I will first put a line through that. Now my bandsaw uh, is a, has a six inch throat on it. So that's the deepest I can cut, but I don't like to cut six inches. 
I like to cut about five and a half if I'm going to make a deep bow. So then I'll take this rule and I'll mark up here five inches. And I'll mark down here five inches. And then I draw two more lines. Now this is on the face of the... I'm looking at the face of the log. So now I've got a... Well, I didn't get that very straight, did I? So now I've got a, a bow blank here and a bow blank here. And I rotate the log then and set it on my, uh, my log that I use for cutting. And as I cut that line right there on the side with the chainsaw, I cut that chain, that side, and then I cut straight through the middle. So now I've got two blanks left of that width. And they would look similar to this, except they would have a flat side on it. So that gives me two halves of a log that I can now take into my shop and uh, uh, the circle of the size of the blank that I want, and then I put it on my bandsaw and saw it out. Now that's how we do the regular bowls. Now if I'm going to do a natural edge bowl, uh, you can hold it up. We don't. All we do is cut the log straight through the center, and we use a log that we. If we want to keep the bark on the natural edge, then we use a log that that the bark is secure on it. And then we take it. This is going to be a small natural edge bow. We take it into the shop, and I have a little router bit, the drill press. And we create a flat spot for the chuck because we're going to chuck that with a screw chuck. And then we'll I mark it. Uh, I've marked my circle on it already, and then I'll take to the band saw and saw that out. So now we have a blank that this is going to be the top of the bow, and this is going to be the bottom of the bow down here. Okay. Do you understand how we cut a natural edge blank? Okay, this is another log. And again, I'll show you, this is what I was demonstrating up here. This is a small log, and you can see the pith is off to one side. So I measured and got two pretty equal bowl blanks, or would get pretty two pretty equal bowl blanks out of that. Okay, now we're st and remember now we're still working with with green wood. Pardon? Don't you ever cut two sections through the middle to cut the pith all the way? I have done that. Uh, if I on these huge logs, if I have a, a log that's really humongous, and I've got one that's probably how what how what's the diameter of that log? Yes, if I have that, yes, I will. And uh, we had, uh, and that's another thing you can do. If you have a great big log, unless you've got a horrendous <laughs> bandsaw, uh, you know, and and nobody's going to turn a bowl that's more than four and a half to five inches deep anyway. So you don't really need a, a really deep blank for a bowl. So if you've got a log that's really, really big, like he's talking about, then I would cut, let's say that this log is huge. I would slice these sides. I would measure from this side in five inches. And that gives me a five inch blank here. I would measure from this side in five inches. And I might have five inches left in here. Okay, I'll slice that. I'll slice these off first, then I'll slice that. And now I've got two bow blanks here, plus I've got a big slab of wood out of the middle. And if that is deep enough, which most of the time it will be, then you can cut the pith right out of it, and you've got nice bow blanks on both sides. And these bow blanks will not move very much because they're right out of the middle of the log. Yeah, that's the bet. In fact, it's the best wood in the log. Question. 
How big a chainsaw are you using? And what does it have to do this? I have an 18. 18 Yes. Uh, I had a 20 and it cratered. Uh, 20s at the outer edge. Uh, most every, what you want is a bar long enough that when you're slicing the logs, you can do it in one cut rather than having to cut this end and then go around and cut it from the other end. So the 18 works real good for me. I'm not familiar with the chainsaw. How big a curve to the chainsaw cut? Does it cut a lot of wood out? Uh, no, about the, about the thickness of your finger is all. Uh, once we have got the bow blank uh, and we've determined our shape, uh, of course, you can, if you're wearing a pacemaker, you're not going to be able to run a chainsaw. Uh, uh, so, but you can run an electric chainsaw. And they do make electric chainsaws, and they make them in 18s. I've got a 16 in an electric. And if I've got to do chainsawing inside my shop, then I use my electric chainsaw because I don't want all that smoke in, inside the shop. Uh, so you can do it with an electric chainsaw. They've got plenty of power to do what we're talking about. It won't do it quite as fast, but it will do it. Uh, so if you're going to do that, if you're going to do green wood, uh, you're going to have to have you're going to have to have something to cut it with. Uh, the uh, they tell me that there's something in that pacemaker that the mag the magnet the magnetism of the flywheel because you got two magnets in the flywheel of, of any kind of a little motor like that that it'll mess up the pacemaker so uh, they don't advise people that wear them to run any kind of stuff like that okay uh, We talked about flattening the sides. Now, try when you when you are cutting these, try to get this thickness uniform. And I'll show you when I we get to the lathe here in a minute why that's important. Uh, sometimes I'm really, really good at going right straight down through that log, being a great flat surface great and then the next time I do it one side of the log will be that wide and the other side will be that wide so I don't get it right every time but there's a way to correct that we'll talk about that uh, when we're when we get ready to, to saw the hold that up the blank into a or the side into a bow blank, and this is a pecan bow blank that I'm going to give away. I use a bandsaw. Now, some people, some of you may not have a bandsaw, or you may not have a bandsaw with a throat large enough to do this. And if you don't, but you have a chainsaw, you can accomplish the same thing with the chainsaw. And I, if I have... Uh, a really really big blank and I've got some blanks that are that, like that I've turned some 15 inch 16 inch bowls I will just lop off while I'm out at the saw I'll just lop the corners off and I won't put that on the bandsaw because my bandsaw table is not big enough to really support it the way it should but if you're going to do this with the bands, bandsaw uh, how many of you have bandsaws how many of you have these blades on it? How many of you have never seen this blade? This is a blade that uh, I didn't even know existed and I was grappling with store-bought blades with uh, trying to cut blow blanks and, and uh, I kept getting them jammed up, et cetera, et cetera. And somebody told me about this and I bought it from Timberwolf and it's a half-inch blade three teeth per inch and I'm going to pass it around and it's a hook blade and the, 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 the blade has a curve to it uh, when it comes down it's curved like that and, it, and uh, what happens 
is when it cuts, the sawdust goes up in here and is drug right through the log by the tooth. So you do not have any sawdust buildup with these blades. And I can cut that blank and it's like putting a knife through a piece of butter with that blade. And uh, if you're gonna saw thick blanks with a bandsaw, then you need to get a blade like this. And I, there, there are other places that have this same kind of a blade but this is the only place that I've found that has it where the blade is hooked. The others have more or less of a straight blade and they may work just as well, I don't know. But this hook blade uh, it works extremely well and they're available uh, right there. And they're, they're, they don't cost any more than uh, what you would pay at uh, Woodcraft or otherwise. I've only got to remember is the length of the blade because the them people that told me on a wood turner's blade, they make them. That's it. Yeah. You say wood turner's blade, they know what you want. They just call them, give them the length of blade you want. They they make the blade. They don't have them in stock. They just make it and ship it to you. Yeah, my first time, they, I said, "Wait, this on the phone with them." I looked at the catalog, told them what I wanted, and she said, "We want it for," and she said, "You don't want that blade. You want this blade." Yeah. And she sat there, so if you. You're not sure. They'll be more happy to help you, and they work me through and got me the right blade. So I, yeah, I can't say enough about them. That's a fantastic blade. Once in a while, they give you an offer. You buy three, they'll send you four. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you something else about that blade. You do not want to get your finger in front of it. <laughs> but I guarantee you that blade will take a finger off before you can jerk it back. So if you do get a blade like that, you be extremely careful and do not ever get your hand in front of that blade when you're pushing that block through it because it'll cut it off in a heartbeat. <laughs> I mean, that's a... Pardon? Uh, not very, not very. It, it will, it cut bullets better than it does nails. If you put a small piece of wood in there, that bait blade will grab it and get you. So you gotta yeah. retain your work. Yeah, you gotta be careful with this blade because it's, uh, it's extremely aggressive. Uh, uh, you just, you, you're not gonna, if you've never used one of them, you're not gonna believe how fast it'll go through that thick of wood. And I, I just couldn't believe it the first time I put a piece in there. It's like, what have I been doing? Talking about, I'm glad you brought, mentioned that. If you're going to deal with uh, trees, uh, cut down trees, you really ought to get you one of these. Uh, this didn't cost much. I think I paid 30 bucks for it. And it's a metal detector. And uh, if you see a ridge on a log that's, looks a little unusual chances are it's got a piece of bob wire down in there somebody tied a piece of bob wire to it a long time ago i have found bullets uh, i have found nails if you cut into a log and if you're looking at your shavings as they're coming out and all of a sudden those shavings turn from brown to a, a dark blue shut that chainsaw off right then because you got night, you got metal in that log, and it'll turn that wood a, a dark blue uh, color on it, and I don't know why, but it does. Friction. Huh? Heat friction. I, well, I don't know what it, what makes it turn the wood blue, but it sure will. But if you see those shavings change color on you, and they shouldn't be that color, then you stop and you get your deal out. Uh, I cut into. A, I had a tree in my front yard. <clears throat> and it and it died and uh, a friend of mine uh, had bought a brand new chainsaw and I was telling him I was going to cut this up and he said he said well, let me come out there and try my new chainsaw on that tree well uh, he he cut a piece of it and I said man that, that's a good chainsaw let me try that so I zipped down into that thing and whap I mean it literally stripped the teeth off of the chain. And I, do, I still don't know what it was. We never did find it. I, I don't, I, it was down inside. I cut down that deep into that tree before I hit it. <laughs> but it literally ripped the teeth off of that chainsaw. And, uh, 
It did what? It said what I found it, it was a square type. Oh, a square nail? Square nail. I tried. It, it tore off several teeth off the pine Yeah. I, uh, I was going to cut it. I, I said, well, I'm going to cut down here. We put another chain on it. This was what he, he went home after this. He said, he put a brand new chain back on it. And I said, well, let me cut it off down here and we'll see what it is. And I hit it again. And I ruined two brand new chains. I mean, just that quick. He said, maybe we better leave it alone. So this is, this is pretty important. Okay. Uh, now, we've got, we've got a, uh, we've got, oh, well, let me talk about this too. Uh, Whenever you're chainsawing uh, these flat surfaces that I'm talking about, you're, I draw my circles on the center side of the, of the deal. And I put it on the, the bandsaw table like that. Okay, you don't have a lot of flat surface there. So when you start making these turns, at some point you're, you're sitting solid, but then you turn and you're not because it is, and it's going to want to do this on you. And you don't want that with this particular blade. You, you don't want that because it can kink your blade, ruin your blade. It can do lots of things. So what I do is I put little shims, and these are nailed on the very ends out here outside the path of the saw. And when I put them then now when I put that down, I've got something for it to sit on. And uh, if, especially if I'm doing little pieces. The big pieces are not, not as bad, but the little pieces like this, you need to shim those in some way to keep that from jerking from one side because that blade will jerk it like that and it'll kink your deal. So those, that's just two little shims you can stick on the bottom of them to make it a little safer to cut. 